Hello and happy World Traveler Wednesday to my fellow travelers and friends. I'm Miss Jules and I'm here again today to teach you about a new country. So let's take off. Don't forget, now is a great time to pause your video, grab your passport, your coloring map, and your travel journal, and also a snack or some water if you want them. All right, I'm going to jump right into it and start sharing my screen with you all. All right. Let's see here. All right, here we go. Kiora. That's how you say hello in the native language of this country. So any guesses as to where we might be traveling to today? I'll give you a hint. It's a Polynesian country and is located on the other side of the earth than we are. So it is very, very far away. If you have a guess that you want to type in the comments below before I change to the next slide, now is your chance. All right, moving on. This week, we are traveling to New Zealand. Now, New Zealand is made up of two islands here. This map shows you some of the big cities. This is the North Island, this is the South Island. And on the next page, I'm gonna show you exactly where you can find New Zealand. So it is an island country located in the South Pacific Ocean on the continent, uh, continent excuse me, on the continent of Oceania. So if we go way over here to the Southern Pacific Ocean, you see Australia here, and then this little country made up of two islands is New Zealand. Pretty awesome. So it's very far away from where we are here. Now because the Earth is a sphere or a 3D circle, you can you don't have to fly all the way this way if you wanted to get there. You could fly back around over the Pacific Ocean to get there as well. But both ways are going to take you quite a long time, longer than 15 hours. All right. Facts about New Zealand. Now, the population of New Zealand is about 5 million people. The land area, or how much space all of the land takes up, is 103,483 square miles. The capital of this country is Wellington. Their official languages are English, Maori, and Sign Language. The currency is the New Zealand dollar. And the geography, as I said, it's made up of two islands, the north and the south. There are glaciers, mountains, volcanoes, lakes, forest, forests. There is a lot of different topography um, in New Zealand, and they do a lot of outdoor things biking, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, um, some rock climbing, there's lots of skiing, so there's a lot of really cool stuff to do outside with their diverse landscapes. Now let's talk about the Maori culture. The Maori people were the first people to live on the islands of New Zealand. They arrived more than 1,200 years ago, and their culture is still very relevant today. The Maori people's native language is called Maori, and I have a little video I want to show you um, where there are two kids that get to explore New Zealand and the Maori culture and see sort of what it's like. So I'm going to switch over screens real quick. Make sure my volume's up loud enough that you all can hear it. And we will play it. Tristan, let's turn up about our adventures today. Yeah. Aka. Today we learned the Haka in New Zealand. New Zealand. I would like to reach out my hand. Oh, Miss Ayo. Um, tell you to roll. Nobody say nobody else. 
The Maori were the first people to find New Zealand. They called New Zealand Aochiora, which means land of the long white cloud. JJ, wait for me. Sure. Swimming time. Oh. Grandma said we could swim in the deep end if we wore a life jacket. <laughs> After swimming, we went to see our friend Pohari so she could tell us about the Maori. Hi, Pohari. Hello, kia ora. There's a special type of greeting that we do, and it's called a hungi. So what you do is you shake the hand of the other person and you press your nose on their nose twice. You ready? We'll try it. One, two. Nice. Kia ora. One, two. Kia ora. Well one. done. What is this place? It's known as Te Puya. Te is the Māori word for the, and Puya means springs where things come up out of the ground. Would you like to have a look inside? Yeah. yeah. Inside, there are lots of wood carved statues. I see this guardian over here. They're all known as guardians. There's 12 of them. This one here, his name is Tafaki. Now, can you see what kind of guardian or what he looks after? What about things that are natural, like in the thunder and there's something else that goes with thunder? Like, yeah. They yeah. carve these. Do they? Yes, they did. It took the students, we've got some carving students here, and it took them almost almost two years to carve each one of these. Pohiri took us inside to learn more about the Maori gods. What's and in that? here, this is Ruomoko. Now he looks after earthquakes, lava. Put your hand in there. There were lots of other Maori gods, and each one looked after something different. That's Rhythm and Pohiri's son, Morgan. They showed us how to play a stick game. So would you guys like to learn this game? It's known as Titi Toria. It's a short stick game. Thank you might need you. to get yourselves a bit more comfortable. Nice. One, two, right? Lovely. Now we'll try the left hand as well. You can clap your sticks together to make a clap. You can, you can. After we practice for a bit, we can clap faster. Hallelujah! <laughs> yeah, you're getting there. Woo! <laughs> Pool. Cooking pool. Yep. Just come and take a seat on the ledge here. So I'm going to put this in, and then is someone going to hold it for me. Yeah, no, no. Okay. If you guys sit down I there, I'll go put it in the pool first, and then I'll come back. Okay. Huh? So we might just need to let it go a little bit. Little beep. Ba ba black sheep, feathery feathery I feel like I'm fishing for corn. You are. On our way to find a place to eat our corn, we saw some bubbly mud. Now, this pool yeah. is known as Hawanu, Hawanu Pools. Bubbly mud, bubbly mud. There's two of them. Can you see them? We also found some geysers and lots and lots of speed. Up way. No, you guys sitting in the bee. But oh, where's the butter? Ah. Mm. Oh. Time to eat our corn. Tastes like butter and corn. Mm. Clay. Just like clay. This is a good day. What do you mean, good day? It's an excellent day. After our snack, we went to learn the haka. That's a Maori warrior dance. That's Guy. Yola. He's going to teach us the haka. Hi, Guy. Hi, Yola, Guy. Boys. What you are the markings on your face? Markings on my face? Yeah. We call them moko. The moko is worn by warriors. How did you learn the haka? We learned, I learned the haka from my father, and he learned from his father. So it's... It's been handed down through our family. Morgan and Rhythm came to do the haka with us. But first, we had to get our cool face markings. Can I have a face of one of the gods? Okay, we can do that one. The one that represents January. Cause that's my birthday. Is this some of my lips? To do the haka, you have to stick out your tongue and eyes and scare off your enemies. <laughs> Scary. Okay, you stand over there. Stand right there. Yeah, that's right. 
Kyombo he. Okay, hey. Okay, very good. Here we go. Kyombo he. Kyombo he. Pukana. 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 Kyombo he. Pukana. A great time scaring off our enemies in New Zealand. Hi, poor Harry. Hi, guys. Oh, those are lovely. Yep, thank you. Hey, before you go, would you like to see one of our performance team do a haka? Yeah! Oh, come on. <laughs> Pretty cool. I really like that video. I think it's awesome. It shows you um, some really cool stuff about the Maori culture. And just you kind of get to see where a lot of their traditions come from. So the haka and um, how they do some of their traditional cooking with the geysers and all that heat coming out of the earth. I think it's pretty awesome. So I have another video I want to show you, but I will show you at the end. So moving on to food. Now, in terms of traditional food made by the Maori, hangi is a traditional Maori dish of meat and vegetables made in an underground oven. Or this picture here is kind of what it looks like. So they gather everything up that they're gonna cook and they put it in like a big net in the ground and all the heat rising up from the earth near the geysers and things like that, cook those vegetables and meat, it's pretty cool. Kamara is a kind of sweet potato introduced by the Maori people as well. In terms of what everyone else eats in New Zealand, um, they eat a lot of seafood, which makes sense because they live on an island. Um, Kina is a certain kind of sea urchin. It's very spiky and inside is a really delicious um, option for food as well. Fish and chips is really popular as well as savory pies. So here in the U.S. we eat a lot of um, fruit pies like blackberry pie, apple pie, or pumpkin pie. Um, and in New Zealand they eat a lot of savory pies. They have pies with meat inside, vegetables, so that's a common meal for them as well. Now, desserts that are popular in New Zealand. Hokey Pokey ice cream, which I think sounds delicious, is um, a caramelized honeycomb flavor, and sometimes it's served with honeycomb as well. They also have Jaffa's, which is a kind of candy, a sugar-coated chocolate ball flavored with orange, and pavlova, which is whipped cream and fruit on top of a meringue. Now, I don't, it looks like our picture's having a hard time loading. So, aha, there it is. Saw it for maybe just a second. Oop. Now, holidays. One important holiday for New Zealanders, or Kiwis as they're called, is Anzac. Anzac Day. That is a day to honor and celebrate those who have died in war, like we have Memorial Day. Theirs is celebrated on April 25th. Matariki is the Maori New Year, and it's celebrated like a whole festival about a month long in the summer, early summertime. Excuse me, I said that wrong. For them, it's winter time. For us, it's summertime in June and July. And Waitangi Day is the national holiday on February 6th, which is when the Treaty of Waitangi was signed and New Zealand became a country. Now, one more thing I want to tell you about New Zealand is I want to talk about how Christmas is celebrated there. Since we're coming upon that time of year, it's kind of interesting to look at it. Now, like I told you, but I already had forgotten, 
Um, New Zealand is located in the Southern Hemisphere, which means Christmas, December 25th, is celebrated in the summertime for them. So many people barbecue or take a picnic out for Christmas Day. In, a nearby, in the nearby country of Australia, um, I have a friend that lives there and she says that they go to the beach every Christmas. Kind of strange for those of us who live in cold climates and in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, often a day when hangi is made. So that's another day when the traditional Maori dish of hangi, of cooking things in the ground, is made. Um, some places and people in New Zealand celebrate twice a year. So on December 25th, they celebrate the actual day of Christmas. And in the middle of July, which is their winter time, they'll celebrate it again. So I was reading that lots of hotels and busy places um, will have Christmas decorations up in July. Pretty cool. So I just want to say thank you for visiting New Zealand with us. Don't forget to put your newest stamp in your passport, color in New Zealand on your map, and write down what you learned in your travel journal. Um, I have a couple crafts for you. The first one, I have one craft for you, and then a video to show you. So in your world traveler folder, looks like this, you are going to find, in fact, let me stop sharing for a moment so I'm a little bit bigger. There we go. So in your World Traveler Wednesday folder, you'll find everything you need for this. This piece of paper has a little fluffy sheep. And also in your kit, you are going to find this little pom-pom. Now it's pretty small, so you might have to dig around a little bit. But what you're going to do is you're going to take some scissors, you're going to cut out your sheep head and the four legs, and then you'll take your pom-pom and glue them on. So you can put your head, you can glue the head right on it and some little legs, however you want to make it look. The reason I chose this craft is because New Zealand has so many sheep that in fact, they have more sheep than people. There are about 30 million sheep in New Zealand and only 5 million people. So six times as many sheep. I think that's pretty interesting and pretty wild to think about. So feel free to glue your, whoa, glue your little sheep craft together. It's really cute. You can just set it on a shelf or you can play with it, whatever you want. And the last thing I want to show you is our last video. And then that will be it. So share our screen one more time. Make sure we can get to it. Now this just tells you a little bit about the history of how the wayfinders navigated the Pacific Ocean and came to places like New Zealand, the Polynesian people. So let's Give it a watch. Imagine setting sail from Hawaii in a canoe. Your target is a small island thousands of kilometers away in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's a body of water that covers more than 160 million square kilometers, greater than all the land masses on Earth combined. For thousands of years, Polynesian navigators managed voyages like this without the help of modern navigational aids. Ancient Polynesians used the sun, moon, stars, planets, ocean currents, and clouds as guides that allowed them to see the ocean as a series of pathways rather than an obstacle. Their voyages began around 1500 BC when the people who would settle Polynesia first set sail from Southeast Asia. Early Polynesians eventually settled a vast area of islands spread over 40 million square kilometers of the Pacific Ocean. Some historians believe the voyagers moved from place to place to avoid overpopulation, others that they were driven by war. Voyages became less frequent by around 1300 AD as Polynesian societies became more rooted in specific locations. 
During the voyaging period, successful journeys depended on a number of factors, well-built canoes, the skill of navigators, and weather being some of the biggest. Voyages relied on sturdy va'akalua, or double-hulled canoes, which were powered by sails and steered with a single large oar. Canoe building involved the whole community, bringing together the navigators, canoe builders, priests, chanters, and hula dancers. Navigators were keen observers of the natural world. They were abundantly familiar with trade wind-generated ocean swells, which typically flow northeast or southeast. By day, navigators could identify direction by the rocking motion of their canoes caused by these swells. But sunrise and sunset were even more useful. The sun's position indicated east and west and created low light on the ocean that made it possible to see swells directly. At night, navigators used something called a star compass, which wasn't a physical object, but rather a sort of mental map. They memorized the rising and setting points of stars and constellations at different times of the year. They used those to divide the sky into four quadrants, subdivided into 32 houses, with the canoe in the middle. So, for example, when they saw the star Pura Atea rising from the ocean, they knew that to be northeast. They had some other tricks, too. The Earth's axis points towards Hokupa'a, or the North Star, so-called because it's the one fixed point in the sky as the Earth rotates, and always indicates north. However, it's not visible south of the equator, so navigators there could use a constellation called Neve, or the Southern Cross, and some mental tricks to estimate where south is. For instance, draw a line through these two stars, extend it 4.5 times, and draw another line from there to the horizon. That's south. But the sky also contains navigational aids much closer to Earth, the clouds. Besides being useful weather cues, under the right conditions, they can indicate land masses. For instance, the lagoons of Pacific atolls can actually be seen reflected on the underside of clouds, if you know what to look for. And high masses of clouds can indicate mountainous islands. Once navigators neared their destination, other clues such as the flight patterns of birds, floating debris or vegetation, and types of fish in the area helped determine the proximity of land. For example, the Manuoku had a known flight range of 190 kilometers and could be followed back to shore. So how do we know all of this? Partially through evidence in petroglyphs, written observations of European explorers, and Polynesian oral traditions but also by trying them out for ourselves. In 2017, a voyaging canoe called Hokulea completed a worldwide voyage using only these techniques. If that seems remarkable, remember the ancient Polynesians, who through close study and kinship with nature were able to forge these paths across an unfathomably vast, vibrant, living ocean. The educator behind this lesson helped TED-Ed's student voice program find its way to Hawaii. Over 30 TED-Ed clubs have since formed in the Hawaiian Islands, and thousands more across the globe. What if every educator and student subs- Awesome! I hope you all enjoyed that little video. I think that is so cool. To think that, I'm gonna look for something I need for you all. To think that, you um that people made it that far in just canoe with a lot different technology than what we have today it's pretty amazing so what you will find in your kit is a lay like this yours might be a different color than mine but these are used in many different polynesian cultures and you can wear yours you can use it you can cut it up and use it for craft whatever you want to do i want you to go for so that's it for this week. I hope that you enjoyed learning about New Zealand, the indigenous Maori people, and a little bit of the Polynesian culture as well. Um, don't forget to leave a picture of your sheep or you wearing your lei, or leave a comment below or on Facebook so that we can enter your name into a drawing to win a really cool goodie bag. And 
I can't wait to see you next. Oh, wait, I don't see you next week. Miss Rosie sees you next week. So I'll see you in two weeks. But I hope you have a great day and you're excited to do some more traveling. Okay, bye everybody.